uh, we can start the session. Um, good morning. Can, can, thanks to come to uh, our session. Uh, this session was organized by me and Andrea Diniz from IBG Brazil. Um, the title is Data Integration, A Way to Improving Agricultural Statistics. Uh, who participate to the last ISI in Malaysia, uh, know that uh, how prominent is this topic on that integration nowadays, uh, in order to take advantage of different sources and to combine administrative data with survey data and, other, and also the use of big data that integration becomes an area of development of a good uh, statistics in general. And also, it is also important for in the case of agriculture. We plan three presentations, uh, but uh, one of the speakers, Dr. Zhu Zengwen from Iowa State, um, uh, couldn't make the, the ICAS because visa problems. In the end, he did not get the visa uh, in time to come. So we will have two presentations. Uh, the first from um, Yilda Liffel um and the second uh, by uh, Ricardo D'Alberto. So, um, Hilda, you present uh, examining uh, this um, information communication technology to let uh, grow using South Africa public private private data set and industry level analysis. Hilda has a master in agriculture economics at the University of Limpopo and is currently developing a PhD studies in the University of Pretoria in the same area. She's a lecturer in the University of Lipopo in the South Africa, and her area of the research is modeling impact of information communication technology on agro-based industries and sector of the economy, and ICT options, uh, access, and usage on agriculture and the whole of ICT in agriculture value chain. And the third area of research is uh, agricultural project policy analysis, including monitoring, evaluation, and impact assessment. So, Yuda, you have the floor, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yuda Lofupani. I'm from South Africa. I will be taking you through how we integrated the public and private data set to model the ICT-led growth in, in, in South Africa. The paper is co-authored by Dr. Mato Galava, who serves as my supervisor for my PhD research. My presentation will cover the background, the research methods, the results, and the conclusion. So in terms of definition of information and communication technology, there are various ways in, in literature in which ICT is, is defined. But for the purpose of our study, we are defining ICT in line with the United Nations International Standards for Industrial Classification. So basically, the ICT is defined as any device or a tool that is used to, to process, to transmit and to communicate information. So this includes the, the cell phones, the computers, internet, and other related tools and, and services. So ICT is, has been credited due to its potential to integrate the world economies by eliminating the barriers to trade, 
caused by distance and time. This promotes the participation of the developing countries in the international market. It also ensures equitable distribution of information across countries by reducing the money and time cost associated with accessing the information. So by ensuring equity in the distribution of information, it promotes the inclusion to services markets and other resources which were previously inaccessible. So it is on this basis that the key international organizations such as the World Bank and the United Nations promote ICT as key for the growth and development of, of the developing countries. However, if we look at the, the, the literature, the benefits from ICT usage uh, have been fully realized by, by the developed countries and not developing countries. The reasons for this is the, are the low levels of ICT investment in the developing countries the late introduction of ICT, the limited human capital, the limited infrastructure base to ensure access and usage of technologies, and the lack of data for measuring impact of ICT. Hence, in this study, we are integrating data from the public and the private sector to model the impact that ICT will have on, on South Africa's economy. So the case study is South Africa, and then the question becomes of all the countries in the world, why South Africa? Besides that, I'm from South Africa. We are focusing on South Africa because it is ranked number one in Africa in terms of the percentage of persons using the internet, the mobile cellular subscriptions, percentage of persons with access to the internet at home. We are also ranked the second in terms of the fixed telephone subscription and mobile broadband subscriptions. We are the third in Africa in terms of fixed broadband subscription and percentage of household with computers at home. Despite this, we are faced with uh, serious economic challenges such as slow GDP growth, high rates of unemployment, poverty, and inequality. And in looking at the solutions to, to, to these problems, the, the World Bank recommended that the inform investment in ICT could be the solution to these problems that I already outlined. We then went on to literature to look how then can we model the impact of, of ICT on South Africa's growth performance. We learned that ICT is modeled as a general purpose technology with impact on the firms, the industries, the sectors and the world economies as a whole. But for the purpose of our study, we are focusing on the, the industry. And the reason for this is that the studies at the aggregate level, they found no significant impact of ICT, while the, those studies that focus on the in industry found positive significant impact of ICT. And the reason for this is that those aggregate studies combined the industries that are categorized as more ICT intensive with those that are less ICT intensive. So all in all, the previous studies found evidence of ICT-led growth for those industries that are either using or producing ICT most intensively. For the purpose of our study, we are specifically focusing on the agro-processing industries for both the economic and the technical reasons. So economically, the agro-processing subsector 
has been earmarked in various policy strategies as the catalyst to spare South Africa's growth and development given its strong backward and forward linkages with other economic sectors. However, looking at the, the, the statistics, it is evident that the efforts that have been put in place to, to support the growth of the sector have been ineffective. Hence, we are attempting in this study to examine to what an extent will ICT usage boost the growth performance of the agro-processing industries. And technically, we are focusing on the agro-processing sector to be able to capture what we call the network effects of technology, which are the productivity gains from ICT use in the non-ICT sector. So agro-processing industry has got various, agro-processing subsector has got different industries with varying levels of ICT use. And therefore we are assuming that ICT-led growth will differ per industry depending on how much a particular industry is using ICT ends. It is important for, for us to, to group the industries into those that are using ICT more intensively and those that are using ICT the least. So for data on ICT investment, we use data from the Statistics South Africa, which is the, the National Statistical Agency of South Africa. Uh, we wanted data from 1994 to 2017 in order for us to, to run the models, but we faced different challenges such as missing data and inconsistent in the manner in which data were collected. So which means that we couldn't proceed with, with our objective of examining the, the impact of ICT on industries. We then turned on to the public, uh, the private sector data, which is collected, managed, and owned by a company called Quantec. And the reason why we used this data together with those that of Statistics South Africa is because the procedure, the methods, and, and everything, they are following the, the way in which Statistics South Africa is is collecting the data and we found it suitable for the current analysis. So we, the data consists of four variables. The first one is the ICT intensity, which is basically the share of industries expenditure on ICT. So the source of data for the ICT intensity is the, both the Statistics South Africa and Quantec. The second objective is labor productivity, which is defined as the gross output per hours worked. The source of data for labor productivity is Quantec. The third variable is employment, which is defined as the total number of employees in a particular industry. The source of data is Quantec. The last and fourth variable is the output which is the quantity of goods and services produced in a particular industry. And the source of data for the output is Quantec. So this is just a, a framework which serves to, to provide uh, a summary of what we are actually trying to do. So this framework consists of three domains, the input, the process, and the output domain. So the input domain houses the ICT sector, which is responsible for the production and supply of ICTs. The process domain houses the agro-processing industries, which are the users of ICT. And then the output domain defines the, interaction, the results of the interaction between the ICT and the agro-processing domain. So the output is defined in terms of the outcome from the intersection of the, the input and the process domain. So the outcomes are in terms of the labor productivity growth, the employment growth, and 
the output growth. We then applied the three analytical tools to, for the purpose of data analysis. The first one is the ICT intensity index, which, which is, is used to categorize the industries into more ICT and less ICT intensive. The second one is the pool demand group estimation used to estimate effects of ICT intensity on growth of labor productivity, employment, and output. The third one is the TY Granger causality test used, used to test for the causal relationship between ICT intensity and growth of labor productivity, employment, and real output. The descriptive results for the ICT intensity shows that 78% of the industries are categorized as more ICT intensive while the remaining 22% are less ICT intensive. So in terms of the ICT intensity per, per industry, the results show that the food industry accounted for a larger share of ICT investment, while the tobacco industry accounted for the smallest share. In terms of the annual growth rates, both the groups of industries are experiencing a decline in employment. However, the less ICT intensive industries are surpassing the more ICT intensive industry in terms of growth of labor productivity and output. So the results show that the ICT intensity yields no impact when industries are aggregated. So if you combine all the, the industries, what is the impact? So the results are showing that there is no impact. And the reason is the, the aggregation of the industries in, in, in the analysis. This is because those industries that are less ICT intensive industries are kind of dragging down those that are more ICT intensive. The results also indicated that ICT intensity yields are positive significant effects on the growth of the industries that are using ICT more intensively. We also found evidence of a causal relationship for those industries that are more ICT intensive. So overall or in summary, this study provides evidence of ICT-led growth for industries that use ICT most intensively. So in conclusion, what are the, the take home messages from, from, from the study? So the first message is that the, an integration of the public and private data set is crucial in unearthing the potential gains from ICT use and also that the, the developing countries can also experience similar gains as developed countries if we have data. And then also, given the economic challenges that are facing South Africa, IC, investment in ICT could be the solution to the problems that are facing South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, then. Uh, oh, now our next speaker is Ricardo Dalberto. He is a postdoc research fellow at the Department of Statistics, Science and Fortunati uh, of the University of Bologna, where we received a PhD on statistics in 2017, uh, discussing the thesis statistical matching imputation among different forms data sources. For the last two years, he has been working in the European Union. H2020 project provide that um, aiming to analyzing public goods producing by US, uh, European Union, agriculture and forestry. Since May, he is working in the, this European project named Console. Uh, that focus on uh, contract solutions for uh, effective and lasting delivery the, of agri-environmental agri climate public goods by UN, uh, by the European Union, agriculture and forestry. 
His main research interests are data integration, impact evaluation, and contrafactual analysis in the observ observational studies context, as well as experimental economics and benefit transfer. Uh, the title of the presentation is From Collection to Integration, Applying Statistical Matching to Primary and Secondary Farm Data. You have the floor, Alberto. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the kind presentation. And let me say that I'm really excited to be here today to give this speech because uh, I got my PhD in statistical sciences, but I started my bachelor in international diplomatic sciences, and then I got my master degree in economics of development. So usually I do attend uh, conferences uh, of uh, methodological statistics, and they are really interested in the developing of methods that they do not care. Well, they usually do not care at all about application, but when you find out that some application could be useful and you find you have evidence of the methodological improvement, it's always good to share. So I'm really, really excited to be here uh, today. I just want to say that this presentation is like a sum of the last four years' work uh, that I've been uh, carrying on with my supervisor, Dr. Mary Raggi, and the Department of Agricultural Sciences of the University of Bologna uh, under the supervision of Professor Davide Viaggi. And let me also say that I totally agree with uh, the speech of uh, Mr. Dominic of this early morning and on the fact that uh, truly there are not so uh, huge differences between uh, countries in terms of data provision and data availability. And when you, uh, we, obviously we uh, are getting used to uh, air about big data and this increasing data flow, but when we um, decided to uh, move in the agricultural field and we uh, decided to look for uh, data on agricultural holdings, it's uh, often really difficult to get data, and I mean elementary data on analyzing uh, agricultural holdings. Uh, I bring the case of uh, uh, Italy, uh, and um, obviously there are a lot of uh, practical issues, uh, such as the shortage of elementary data, obviously, and the heterogeneity of data, as well as the uh, constraint imposed by uh, privacy claims, by uh, the huge cost, the uh, long-lasting procedure uh, um, referred to new data collection. But there is also uh, another problem that you uh, usually meet when you have to deal with agricultural economists. When you want to uh, measure and you, you want to uh, carry out um, a counterfactual analysis, so you want to evaluate, for example, the impact of a policy, uh, well, you have to take into account the specificity of the area, uh, the characteristics of the area, and also the fact that uh, policy measures can be really specific. They can be really different among the different regions uh, of w one um, country. So you have to take into account the fact that there is this specificity, and usually you do not have the data. As um, my colleague said before, uh, well, you want to measure the impact of something, but you, have, you are supposed to have a lot of data, but basically you do not uh, meet the data uh, useful, the quality data useful to uh, assess that impact. So, suitable solution is to integrate uh, the information already at disposal, and uh, there are several methods to do that. Uh, record linkage, a special approach, uh, multiple imputation, and statistical matching, which I used to, uh, I'm used to call a big family with slightly different purposes. But when I started my PhD, uh, we decided to uh, work on statistical matching because when you have different data sources and you want to create uh, a synthetic complete data set, you can approach uh, this problem through statistical matching, which is characterized by two main features. The first one is that you observe one set of jointly observed variables and two sets of the jointly observed vari variables that are referred to uh, two different sets 
of units. So the, obs the observations that you have are disjoint. And this is really important to keep in mind because even yesterday I heard about uh, record linkage uh, method, um, which is uh, similar and often it is conceived uh, to be really close to statistical matching while they are two uh, data fusion methods but they are uh, slightly different. And these differences are really important because when we approach uh, a record linkage problem, we, usually, uh, we are usually dealing with uh, a set of observations that are at least partially overlapping, while statistical matching consider sets of units that are disjoint. So if we consider record linkage uh, like a discriminant analysis, we uh, are in the case when, where we uh, want to say, well, uh, the observed variables refer to some observation are uh, more or less misreport. Why, with statistical matching in the micro framework, we want to, um, uh, to create this uh, uh, data set that is synthetic in the sense that it's synthesized the information collected by different sources, and this, it, but it is also complete because it collects all the information that are relevant for further analysis. And why the non-parametric approach? Well, because uh, it gives some uh, pros with respect to the parametric one. Uh, first of all, the mm, integration of information is based only on real observed data, and we can avoid the model misspecification bias, which is obviously uh, a potential bias. It, it is not uh, obvious that, we'll, uh, that we will encounter this bias, but often when we want to go behind the integration on data and we want to use it for models or, for example, in the observational studies context, which is the one I know more, uh, and which is the one I guess that uh, it's, um, you can encounter the most in the agricultural economics field, well, Usually, if you uh, have imposed a model on the data integration, when you uh, try to find out the uh, relation of cause effects on the data, you uh, tend to go back to the model that you imposed on the integration. And that's obviously something that we um, would av avoid. Mm, but it is also important um, um, rather than the computational advantages that the non-parametric approach gives with respect to the parametric one, this fact. So if we want to uh, go um, addressing a specific problem of impact evaluation uh, and we have no means to uh, plan an experimental design analysis, uh, it is useful to uh, try to combine data if we do not have them uh, combining those two approaches, so the statistical matching approach from one side and the propensity score matching approach or other kind of counterfactual approaches um, if we have to analyze data behind the integration. So the general framework, uh, we have two data sets and we can name them uh, recipient and donor respectively and let's uh, assume that we observe a generic unit i and a generic unit j in the two data set, and as you can see, we have two sets of jointly observed variables, the bold x, and two uh, disjointly observed set of variables, respectively bold k and bold z. Well, we have these two sources. We want to create a synthetic complete data set, as I told you, uh, and what we want to do is to exploit the information uh, given by the uh, matching variables. We can choose some relevant variables uh, within the uh, bold x available one that are observed uh, between two, uh, the two data set that we have um, in order to uh, impute uh, the variables of interest, let's say a subset of the k variables from the donor to the recipient. So, as I told you, uh, we define a subset of k bold uh, variables in order to input them in the synthetic complete data set that we want to uh, observe. Um, 
I won't bore you with um, uh, methodological um, uh, stuff, but just keep in mind that we usually have three basic assumptions. We consider the union of the observation collected by means of the recipient and the donor data set as a unique sample of uh, one target population as well as uh, a unique sample of the same target population are the uh, x bold variables that we jointly observe between the two data set. And we also impose usually the conditional independence assumption saying that the uh, variables that are disjointly observed between the data set R and data set D um, are independent given the uh, variable, the bold X variables. And this is important, in, and I will um, talk about that a few minutes at the end. Usually, we uh, assume um, behind the missing, the mechanism of missingness, so the missing values mi mechanism, the missing a random or missing completely a random assumptions. Uh, we have four parametric, non-parametric techniques, which are called the odd deck methods that you can see list and over there, and I just want to stress that the first three techniques, the nearest neighbor distance, its constrained version, and the random deck technique at distance base, which means that we use metrics inside those techniques in order to define the closeness or the proximity or the similarity, if you want, between the generic unit I and generic unit J. And well, mm, just keep in mind that the nearest neighbor distance uh, allows to minimize the absolute difference between uh, this generic unit i and that generic unit j with respect to the chosen matching variables. While if you want to constrain um, this uh, nearest neighbor distance technique and we want to discard an already matched uh, donor unit, uh, um, we can uh, have this uh, uh, linear programming framework constraints that allows to discard this unit. But keep in mind that if we want to use this constraint version, obviously we mm, cannot have the condition, the scenario of uh, uh, a minor uh, dimensionality ratio of the recipient donor with respect, of the recipient data set with respect to the donor one. The random deck technique uh, as the name says, is the most naive technique because it picks basically at random one donor unit to be matched with a recipient one, but we can constrain this uh, uh, initial pattern of uh, observation uh, with uh, donation classes. So we can create homogeneous subgroup of, um, uh, of units in order to uh, refine this technique. Uh, last but not least, the rank of deck techniques, which ranks the units, so it ranks the observation uh, before to uh, mm, compute the uh, differences between i and j. So it calculates the empirical cumulative distribution function with respect to the chosen matching variables. Um, distance functions. As I told you, the first three uh, techniques were uh, are distance-based, um, and how we define uh, the, the metrics. Well, um, if a generic distance function um, uh, um, can uh, show these three properties, which are symmetry, non-negativity, and identity, we can say that uh, assuming the identity of the equals and the triangle inequality, uh, we are in the context of the generic Minkowski room uh, matrix defined uh, by Mardia in 1979, and we can derive from this generic metric um, different distances, which are, as you can see, um, the Manhattan, the Malanobis, which is the default distance function usually used by the ODEC techniques uh, or the ODEC method, and the exact matrix, which is not uh, a metric, but has to be conceived more as a semi-metric because uh, the assumption to does not hold for it, so is uh, more or less an index and not a semi-metric. Um, what they do, uh, well, basically uh, those distances, the Manhattan distance allows to um, 
associate to match the units um, uh, considering the absolute difference between them with respect to the matching uh, variables that we have chosen, while the Malarobis uh, um, distance allows to uh, weight the units with respect to the uh, variance covariant matrix um, of the chosen matching variables. And the exact index that I already told you uh, should be useful when we consider a different um, matching variable. So we have categorical and continuous bold X variables, but it is not a metric because assumption two does not hold is an index. And that should be considered when we decide to approach um, a distance-based integration with the exact index. Uh, so to recap, four techniques uh, and three distances. We proposed in 2007 uh, a paper um, that analyzed through simulation the different combinations and how they perform in terms of different scenarios of integration. So different dimensionality ratio between the recipient and the donor data set, uh, minor or major variability of the chosen matching variables, uh, building or not the donation classes, and so on. So, we also wanted to go behind the analysis of the joint distribution function of the variables, because usually in the parametric framework of statistical matching, we address the uncertainty be behind the joint distribution function. But if we do not um, impose any constraint, any model constraint, any relations on the variables that we observed, and if we um, do not want to address uh, uh, marginal distribution of the variables, um, we want just to assess the goodness of the com synthetic complete data set created. So we proposed a validation strategy based on really simple tools uh, uh, graphical tools, the graphical distribution of the variables pre and post the imputation and their uh, graphical uh, distribution in terms of overlap, um, the mean square error of the so-called variable W and the Ellinger uh, index. But um, how we define the variable W? We uh, wanted to um, just exploit all the observed information and not to resort to any parametric assumption, any model assumption. So we had some proxies, uh, as it usually um, happened, um, in the um, uh, recipient data set. And we uh, decided to use some um, imputation var variables to um, make this comparison between the originally observed one and these proxies uh, that have been inputted. The application. Uh, this is just one of the uh, four applications that we had in the context of agricultural economics with um, the team of uh, Professor Viaggi of the University of Bologna, but this is really um, relevant, at least <laughs> my modest opinion, because we uh, wanted to uh, um, analyze the impact of the agroenvironmental schemes. The agroenvironmental schemes are um, measures that the uh, European Union uh, provided in the last programming period, um, and they were uh, structured in the way uh, we could give payments to uh, farmers who provided agri-environmental benefits. So under the common agricultural policy, they were targeted to say, well, if you are compliant with certain thresholds, uh, due to the fact that you, farmer, you are doing this work, you are providing public goods, but you are not paid for them, for them you will be paid for that if some thresholds are uh, achieved. But basically, first problem, measures are different because they are defined usually by region. I think about Italy and the context of Emilia Romagna, there are different measures. So there are different targets of this measure. And this is important also for the incoming future because the European Union under the common agricultural policy is switching the payment through results-based uh, mm, schemes. And this is really important because if we do not have data to properly uh, identify the results of the of the measures of the policies, we cannot give the correct amount of money to the farmer or we would be 
unable, totally unable to say, well, this is the threshold you have to, you are supposed to uh, reach, you achieve, and this is the threshold that you really achieve. So this was one, uh, let's say, uh, theoretical problem. And on the other side, the practical one was the lack of a complete data sources that could collect altogether a county stru accounting structural um, information, but also information on policy uptake and socio-demographic characteristic of the farmers. I really appreciated the, the um, speech of Dr. Meta yesterday about the uh, farmer-centric data. Usually we have, um, within the European Union context, the FADN data, which are so valuable because they collect a lot of information about the European Union farms, but they are mainly accounting data. So all the agricultural economies, they get to use those data, but they do not collect enough information on policy uptake, and that's a problem, because if we want to uh, switch to results-based uh, instruments to uh, plan um, farm product, agricultural production, we want to uh, give, uh, provide payments for the additional benefits the agriculture provide to us, uh, we should collect those kind of information. So we decided to try to create these uh, synthetic complete data sets uh, with all the uh, macro information of interest, uh, starting from two um, data sets. The FNDN data from one side and primary data, an ad hoc project survey that was carried out within a European Union financed uh, FP7 um, project that was um, not at all um, uh, it was not at all targeting the uh, agroenvironmental schemes assessment, but we included key uh, relevant uh, questions about agroenvironmental schemes, about the uptake of the measures and the level of payments and the um, areas of uh, um, implementation of the measures. So that's to combine the two. Um, data sources. The idea was to identify as matching variables the specialization of the farm and the total agricultural area. So those were the matching variables and we decided to input some of the structural variables that were needed to properly approach a counterfactual analysis. So we transferred mainly the uh, utilized agricultural area referred to the individual crops which were which was an information, a bunch, a pattern of information that was lacking in the survey. Uh, also because uh, farmers usually, they are really hard to uh, say how much land they are allocating for a certain crop instead of another, um, and it takes time to clearly uh, collect this information. So we used the, um, some of the imputation variables uh, as I told you, the utilized agricultural area referred to individual crops, uh, uh, summing up them and comparing them to the total utilized agricultural area of the farm. Has the uh, W variable that I told you uh, before in order to implement the validation strategy. We adopted this combination of nearest neighbor distance technique and Manhattan distance function upon the others because we, uh, as I told you, uh, run simulation about the better performance in the, present of, of, in the presence of outliers instead of um, different dimensionalities, instead of uh, the variability of the matching variables. And we checked the distribution pre and post the imputation of the targeted variables, the uh, overlap of the uh, variables of interest, the distribution of the W variable and the mean square error, which is uh, sensibly uh, uh, lower than all the other mean square error provided by the other combination, and the linger measure. The linger measure substantially is, um, gives us um, an idea of the dissimilarity between the distribution we want to target. So uh, if we um, uh, take as threshold the 5%, uh, we have to refuse the hypothesis that the uh, two distribution that we are targeting are similar. Uh, so uh, to conclude, uh, 
we created this synthetic complete data set uh, with all the relevant information on farms as requested by the uh, agricultural economics we were working uh, with, and we provided a more determinant variables for the policy impact assessment of the agroenvironmental schemes. Um, and this one has been another work on the um, as I told you before, going behind the integration of data. We used the integrated data to provide analysis, and it was useful uh, to do that because we used only real observed information, but also and almost because uh, using uh, the two data sets separately, so um, carrying uh, out uh, an impact evaluation of one on just one or just the other uh, data source, uh, obviously was not possible for certain variables because, for example, taking into account the survey data, we didn't uh, have merely the uh, individual crops utilized agricultural area. But managing to use just one of the two uh, separately, um, the significance of the analysis, of the counterfactual analysis was far lower and also the robustness of the results. But obviously there are mm, some uh, further developments that could be uh, addressed. First of all, I know that uh, someone of you may think about the uh, odd nature of the application because it is uh, related to uh, Italy, it is related to a primary source that uh, is fed by uh, administrative data. But just think about the, uh, the opposite uh, integration. We could be able to feed administrative data. If we think that the um, uh, Department of Agricultural Statistics uh, has carried out, uh, uh, financed by European Union project, competitive project that they won, uh, basically every year or every two years, an ad hoc survey on the Emilia Romagna region or the northwest of Italy, uh, adding the relevant var variables of interest and also uh, establishing guidelines for the ad hoc survey, it could be possible to feed up FADN data, which are mainly accounting data. So the other uh, process, the, the inverse process is also uh, suitable and we are actually working on it. But it is also uh, important to stress some methodological advances uh, that are needed. Usually, um, we do not use weights when we integrate data uh, under uh, this non-parametric framework, but it could be useful to try to detect uh, units' weights and include them into the integration process, as well as there is mm, one main assumption that is uh, used by uh, uh, statistical matching practitioner. And we usually say that samples are representative sample of the same target population. But what if it is not true? So we have to move behind this mere assumption and we uh, should be able to uh, take into account this uh, problem. And thank you very much. Thank you, Bertrand. Excellent presentation. Um, okay, first I will open the floor for questions. I have some, but... Please, can you, can you approach here? Because uh, we, do, we, we have a micro mic. You can, please. Please, please introduce yourself. And, yeah. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sandra Modise. I'm from Botswana. Uh, thank you, uh, presenters, for quite informative presentations. Uh, my question is directed to my neighbor, uh, my lady standing uh, next to you there. Uh, she talked about public and private data set. Uh, I believe that Stats SA collects data also from private sectors. Yes, so um, you said use data from Stats SA and data from uh, that other entity, I forgot the name. 
what what measures did you put in place to ensure that the data that you used for that essay is not the same as the ones that you use for the private entity? Because it's possible that the same data that you are using is actually one data used in that essay. You understand? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then the other thing, um, your your analysis. I didn't get the the years of the study, the time frame okay. of the study. So if you could elaborate on that, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. No. No. Any other? Comment or question? That uh, when you use the linear programming problem, uh, there are some alpha i and beta j's you defined. And uh, how you calculated this alpha i and the beta j, the, the, they are the weights actually, and whether it by trial and error or by any other technique. You get, you get this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you, you can repeat the, the, question. the question. In the linear programming yeah. problem, you use that alpha i plus Sigma j, beta j, and that, uh, that yeah. one, the variable. So that alpha i and beta j is the weights. So how you assume that weights? Is it by trial and error or by any other technique, statistical technique? Any other? So I, I, I will put my, my question. <laughs> yes. Well, we have different use of that uh, integration. Eh? Uh, a very common use on uh, agricultural survey is to come up with the frame. Eh? So in this case, we are looking for identification of the duplications. In the duplication, we expect to have the, the same units in the two survey. The Alberto uh, brings a, another kind of uh, approach that is statistical matching. Not, not, not necessarily have the same units in the two database uh, that provide uh, additional possibility in terms of um, getting more information or relation with the diff from different sources. Uh, but one, one time we discussed this, including with Marcello, uh, there, there is one question in terms of it works well when the x variable has some correlation with the other variables that we want, want to put together. So uh, I want you to elaborate a, a, a bit about the correlation about the x variable and the, the, the other ones in terms of come up with a, a so sometimes we are able to do a good job with part of the data, but not a good job of the other part. So comment on this. We can start. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. The question on the, the data the data time period, it, it ranges from 1994 to 2017. Okay, so in terms of ensuring that the, the data is, 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 is it the same or different, so what we, we observed is that this SA will collect data, let's say, for, for computer activities this year, and then next year they don't. They, they, they collect on telecommunications activities and, and so forth. So we use the data for Quantec for, for those activities that the, the state's essay didn't collect for that particular period. So there, there is no data duplication.
Okay. Alberto. Well, uh, thank you very much for both the questions. Um, so, uh, I meant that uh, with respect to the constraint nearest neighbor distance, you usually approach the um, uh, constraints as in a linear program. So, you say that basically if a unit belongs to the uh, set of 0 and 1, so you have uh, an omega equal to 0 and 1, you just um, rank the observation and then you say this is the uh, donor that we want to match, so it belongs to the uh, to the uh, capital omega. Uh, so if it's zero, it's okay; it will uh, stay there. If it's one, it's already matched, so we discard it. It's just as you uh, told uh, a, a way of putting weights, but the real weights that you put inside the Liran program they are given by the the matrix by the distance. So if you decide to use the uh, Malanobis distance function, the weights are given by the variant covariant matrix. So you have the inverse of the matrix for the uh, observation i and j uh, with respect to the chosen matching variables and you weights them. That's the uh, most simple case. But obviously mm, that impose, that um, comes up has a problem if you have previously defined homogeneous subgroup because you are basically subsetting the information. So you should be able to maybe uh, mix up the uh, approaches with a parametric one and it should be, and this is tested. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it is proven that you, if you, uh, on the first step, um, make a path for similar to multiple imputations. So if, if you uh, put parametric weights and then you do it, you uh, definitely uh, increment the uh, robustness of the, of the matching. And yeah, with respect to your question, <laughs> thank you very much again, uh, because uh, it, that is true. When you have uh, high correlation uh, between the x bold x variables that you use, so the matching variables and the other information that you want to input, um, there is a problem. Another problem that you have to take into account, and it is uh, usually suggested, and we tested it with, uh, within our simulation to, again, mix up the approaches. So to you, um, on the first step, you decide um, a framework for multiple imputations. So you define correlation and you uh, uh, say, well, uh, there is this uh, amount of uh, link, this is this amount of relationship between the x and the variables that you want to input. So you have to relax the CIA, so the conditional independence assumption, and you relax it and then you go back to the uh, non-parametric framework. But um, it is not, uh, I, I wouldn't say that it is a problem of the quality of the result, because the result stays more or less, uh, mm, not more or less the same, but you can uh, always reach a good quality of integration. It is a matter of computational effort, I will say, if you have to take into account the relation. So if there is a high relation between the x variables and the one you want to input, you have to relax this, the CIA. You, you cannot uh, make this assumption uh, standing. And then the real problem comes when you have to go beyond the integration, when you want to use the data. It was, uh, I was saying it, if you want to um, analyze data and find out the cause-effect relationship, me, most time you go back to the uh, relation that there is between the data. So maybe you should be uh, able uh, ex ante to define through the uh, sampling framework this uh, relation between the, va the variables you, you want to use. I do not know if I, uh, I got the point. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, uh, well, um, if you have no other question, so I close the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alberto and Yuda and uh, the audience for your attention. And good afternoon, everyone. I invite you all for the lunch at Swimming Pool Lawn and Hardcourt area adjacent to Convention Hall downstairs at ground floor. 
swimming pool lawn and hard court area uh, adjacent to convention hall lobby okay thank you so much